<clears throat> Hi everyone, welcome back to my YouTube video channel today. I am excited to have Dr. Bill uh, Hang, Dr. William Hang's uh, an orthodontist for more than four decades and uh, he's been uh, a master of uh, facial aesthetic dentistry, facial auto aesthetic dentistry, uh, but he's also a master of uh, airway space. Uh, he trained thousands of uh, clinician throughout many years of his career. And today I invite, uh, I'm an honor and, and excited to uh, be uh, to invite uh, Dr. William Heng into my podcast uh, with a um, group of uh, 10,000 subscribers today and talk about the issue of the traditional uh, orthodontist and and orthodontist that he's been doing and he's seen the uh, the, uh, the significant uh, outcome of his patient for uh, feeding young kids to adults in uh, sleep issue. Dr. Feng, uh, thank you so much for your uh, time today. I'm, thank you very much. I'm happy to be able to share this information with you. It's uh, It's been part of my life for all these years. I've been involved in the airway arena for more than 30 years, and I've been teaching others. Uh, it's I can't get away from it. I have to share a story. My wife and I were at the grocery store just two days ago, as a matter of fact. I'm standing in line to check out, and here's a magazine, as you see, at the checkout counter. The entire, it's a, actually a, a publication all about ADHD. For $14.99, I could have bought this, this thing, and it had article after article on ADHD. I, I pulled it down, looked at it, because I was in a long line. Mm -hmm. I paid for the articles. There had to be 15 to 20 articles all about ADHD. Not one of these articles mentioned anything about airway and or sleeping. Nothing. They were things about take this, this supplement, eat this, that, whatever, get this kind of treatment and whatever. It's interesting because one of my uh, mentors in this whole arena is Dr. Steve Sheldon, who was formerly head of the pediatric sleep clinic at Lurie Children's Hospital in Chicago, uh, a very well-known researcher. And he said many times in his lectures, I do not believe there is such a thing as ADHD. And he said, and he repeat that same statement. He said, I believe it is always, and that's a very strong word for a researcher. For a researcher. He said, I believe it is always an airway issue. Now, when you look at the numbers, and you can do this, uh, most recently, I think I saw it was about 15% uh, of the kids have ADHD. Now, what happens to those kids? Some of them don't do well in school. Most of them don't do well in school. Many of them don't even graduate. Some of them get involved with drugs because they... They get negative feedback all the time, and they don't do well. Some of them get involved with the wrong thing and, and become criminals. The prisons are full of that. But what we're going to share now with you is some more of this kind of information that give you a sense of urgency about how this really is about health care and not about teeth. And what you'll find amazing is that there's really nothing new. Back when the Titanic was on the ocean and it sunk, people were already talking about treating in the primary dentition. And you can see this article from 1912 talk about, above all, eliminating mouth breathing. <clears throat> and he campaigned, this Dr. Bogue in this article, campaigned against removal of teeth and how mouth breathing was such a big problem and you needed to eliminate it by age six. Well, I went to orthodontic training back from 1970 two to 74 and never literally talked about mouth breathing and its effect on anything. We were pretty much taught it was all genetically determined that kids had crooked teeth. So, and this is a final quote here, which, you know, really you can see that big word there at the bottom called uh, yeah. adult dentitians would erupt in good order and their bodies would be healthy. In reality, I don't remember that word healthy being used in my orthodontic training at all. I'm sorry, Not so what we I, uh, Are you planning to share something? Because you, I haven't, you haven't shared the screen yet, I guess. So, you can't see it? So you okay. Can, you can share it uh, as you talk, as my hours are far away talking. 
Well, let me let me start over again here then. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Where do we get out this do the screen share? Here. Okay. Wait a minute. We didn't get it up. Okay. Sorry. Make it right up. Okay. All right, he'll play. Okay, can you see now? Yep, yep. You can okay, hear. sorry, everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, well, let's go through the slides again here. Uh, here's some, so, some information from the referee literature of about 100 years ago, over 100 years ago, and you can see this orthodontist uh, was talking in this article about eliminating mouth breathing as being the big thing that needs to be done and doing it prior to age six. Uh, and here he was back in the late 1800s. Uh, he, this person was campaigning against removal of teeth and, and talking about how lots of different problems that health issues that the kids have would be eliminated if they became nasal breathers by age six. Uh, and at the bottom of this slide, you see this word that just jumps out at you called healthy. And I have to share with you that that was not a word that was used in my in my orthodontic training, we were there to learn to straighten teeth, and I learned how to do that very well. But um, things changed, and in this slide, we see uh, this. Although this person was treating uh, dinner treatments when patients were as young as three years old, and everyone has been very happy with them, but today, orthodontic treatment of the deciduous dentition is rarely undertaken, and neither pediatricians nor the general public have shown any interest in it. The fact is that things change, and and we won't even get into why, but they changed into now the standard is pretty much wait until all the teeth are in and then straighten them in adolescence, which is pretty much like saying, oh, don't bother with getting your kid glasses just because he's in kindergarten and uh, he can't see the the, uh, the blackboard or he can't read. Uh, wait until he's done growing and then you can get some glasses. Makes that much sense. This one out of 1909, uh, from another journal, the Dental Cosmos, they even talking about how brain development was retarded. Now, we think we have people right now that are talking about that, and we think that's new, but it's not new. Uh, I love this book, which was from New York City, and it, there's some things in here that people probably don't know. They used to have uh, uh, adenoid parties where kids, a, a whole group of kids would have their adenoids taken out uh, I'm, I've been to birthday parties and wouldn't want to go to an adenoid party as a kid, that's for sure. But this was done way back when. And uh, even Charles Dickens got into this uh, author and talked about how kids, kids were delinquent and all these other uh, uh, behavioral issues associated with chronic mouth breathing. Uh, and again, here's the, at the bottom here, another remove the causes of mouth breathing. This is 1922. And this is a physician, an, an MD, writing in this journal. <clears throat> and mouth breathing um, can be overcome by the uh, removal of nose and throat obstructions followed by forced breathing exercises. I love this. The child should be asked to run with his mouth closed a short distance daily, causing a forced rapid breathing through the nose. The distance should be gradually increased until the child can breathe as freely through the nose as is necessary. This will enlarge the breathing spaces and correct the habit. Now, this is 1931. Now, that picture of me in the upper left is me running the Boston Marathon for the 11th time last April. And I did it, did it with my mouth taped. I, in reality, I've been running with my lips together for 12 years now. And I've run 19, uh, I, see, I've run 15 marathons with my lips together. I ran 19 with my mouth hanging open. But this is becoming a big deal now. And you even see this in September of last year, this uh, very well-known number one women's tennis player is practicing with their lips together. And another person here on the right ran a marathon in France with his mouth con uh, together. Actually, he's a Buteco breathing uh, consultant. But... Even before I did this, Frank Seaman, who's also a dentist, by the way, from Colorado Springs, runs up Pike's Peak with his mouth taped. 
I'm crazy, but I'm not that crazy to run up Pike's Peak with my mouth tape. The point is you can learn to become a nasal breather. And I have a long face because I wasn't a nasal breather. Uh, and we've got this very, very talented American runner here. You can see her sprinting and she's got her lips together. And you can see her in the upper right picture with the uh, woman in the middle who's, I, th I believe, Russian with her mouth wide open. She looks really pretty frantic. And yet Sonia Richards-Ross looks like she's going to coast to victory here with her lips together, even running as a sprinter. And the New, New Zealand rugby team here practices on the hills of New Zealand with their, with their uh, mouth taped like this. These are rough people. If you've ever seen them play rugby, you don't want to mess with guys like this, but they're training with their lips together. There's a com growing awareness now uh, in, around the world of learning to become nasal breathers. But the fact is that we've known this for more than 100 years. Now, let's look at a young boy who is a chronic mouth breather starting at age eight, and I have all these pictures of him because we lined his teeth up for him. His mother didn't listen to me and, and ignored the fact that he was a mouth breather. And you can see this black line, which we call the Bolton norm, superimposed on his forehead and the bridge of his nose. And you can see how far back his face has fallen over a period of eight to nine years. Now, you say, well, so what? He looks like a lot of other people. Yes, so what? That's his airway. And with that airway, he's at high risk for sleep apnea, on a statistical basis. And in reality, he does have sleep apnea. His face has fallen back so much, his soft palate has fallen back like crazy, his tongue has fallen back like crazy, and his airway is compromised. And the fact of the matter is, this is not okay. The only thing he has to do, he can wear a CPAP machine, but the fact of the matter is, it's not going to prevent him from having a heart attack or stroke. So that's a picture of me in a sandbox in Illinois when I was about three years old. And you can see my lips are apart there. If you look at me here now, I have a longer face from here to here. I tape my lips every night and have I've done that. Uh, and it helps me sleep and breathe better. And Pretty much I got get rid of my, I never get colds anymore. I used to get two a year. But let's look at another boy, and people talk all the time about extraction of teeth and how it's necessary. We can see an incredibly crowded boy here where most people are going to say you've got to take out teeth for him. But in reality, no, we're not going to take out teeth for him. And I tell the family you need to get him, not only can I not remove teeth, but you need to have him become a nasal breather, and he's a chronic mouth breather. So I straighten his teeth without removing any, which is no big deal. But he continues to be a mouth breather, and his face falls back dramatically, just like many of you have kids and grandkids. And most kids today actually have their faces fall back just like this. So whether or not I took out teeth, it doesn't matter. In this case, it would have been worse if I think if I took taken out teeth, but I didn't take out teeth. And this is what he looks like with his mom taking a picture of him as he's on the couch with her cell phone. And you see his mouth wide open. And the fact is, again, his face is so far back, the soft palate is, is really back there, and he has a diagnosis of sleep apnea. That's a big deal. The only way out of this for him is to do double jaw surgery to get both jaws brought forward. And that's all fine if you got a spare fifty dollars to $100,000 and a diagnosis of sleep apnea, you can have that done. Point is, let's try to prevent it. You can say, well, gee, just have him wear a CPAP machine for the rest of his life. That's a sexy mask that you put over your face. And the fact of the matter is, uh, now for over almost eight years, we've known that that doesn't provide a statistical benefit for preventing heart attack or stroke, which are the two main things associated with sleep apnea. But it's not about life and death. It's also about behavioral issues. And here, this is a, a study from 12 years ago, very well known and well quoted about the need for special education for these kids who have sleep di disordered breathing. And their quality of life is not okay. My good friend, Phil Cooper from Savannah, Georgia, wrote this book about why African-American kids can't read. It really relates not to the color of their skin, but the fact that many of them have had sleep apnea. And by the time they 
they get to first grade, they're they're not, they've got brain damage, and they're not gonna they're not not gonna do well in school. Whether their skin is black, white, green, purple, or orange, it doesn't matter. They're not going to do well. And one of the best known names uh, in all of sleep is Gozal, David Gozal and his wife, Layla Karandish Gozal, have this article published in 2018, uh, Optimize the Repair and Recovery of Brain Tissue in Children with Sleep Apnea. This is a very big deal. And Ron Harper, one of my very favorite people, is a neurobiologist at UCLA, has done a lot of research, and you can see he chronicles the structural damage uh, that occurs with just one night of, of uh, reduced oxygen saturation. He uses MRIs to do this. Uh, he talks about motor, motor coordination being affected, and this increases someone's chances of uh, hypertension uh, down the road. So... <laughs> Another, another one here, which is great, more evidence from the referee literature, again by David Gozell, significant reductions of gray matter involved in movement, memory, emotion, speech, perception, decision-making, and self-control. Well, pretty much what else is there that's important in several regions of the brains of children with sleep apnea? So hopefully I have your attention for those of you who have kids and grandkids. It isn't about teeth. What we're talking about here today is not about teeth. Uh, so what do we have as dentists? What can we do? Lateral expansion of both arches, even though I was taught that you couldn't expand the lower arch. I did it for my, my kids who are now 48 and 46. Uh, and we've had it done for one of my grandkids too. Uh, that's a nice start. Uh, but more importantly, we must develop the face forward. And that's where the profession really doesn't seem to understand that. We have a problem here that the faces fall back and that compromises our airways. So the whole point of this presentation here is that we got to improve the restoral posture and improve the muscle tonicity with myofunctional therapy. Myofunctional therapists are every bit as important as we are as dentists, if not more important. And we need to have this happen really early. So let's look at an example of a father who has had orthotics done. And yes, he's had teeth taken out and been retracted. And his maxilla and his mandible are back from this norm that we like to say. But he doesn't look different than most people. He looks, he fits right into society. His airway is like very small uh, and he does have sleep apnea. And he's had heart issues too. He will not lead probably a normal life and not have a, he will not be an old man. It's very unlikely that he will. This is his daughter, whose face is already falling back a little bit. And you notice her lips are apart rather dramatically, like 10 millimeters or more. And yet, we just look at the kids like this and think, well, that's normal. No, it's not normal. Those are her teeth. And you can say, well, what would you do for her? Well, let's show you what we did, because she traveled from Seattle to Los Angeles to see me for me to do this. We literally pushed her upper front teeth out and made her look kind of awkward here initially. But in reality, what we're doing is making her teeth be in her face where they were meant to be and would have been had she had proper restoral posture. Then we bring the mandible forward using a technique which we teach in our mentorship program. It negates the headgear effect of any appliance which holds the jaw forward, which tends to retract. It does that because of the design and it makes it so that the muscles can't pull the mandible back. So you can see how her face came forward nicely using what we call the Bolton norm. But more important than that, you can see her airway, which is pitifully small on the left-hand side at 13.1 millimeters squared. Uh, minimal cross-section over on the right, you can see that it goes to 186.1 millimeters squared after the treatment. Look at how we moved her upper teeth forward. We moved her lower jaw forward, and that opened the airway. So there she is before the treatment, and here she is as a teenager. Uh, she competes on her horse and goes all over the United States as a healthy child. And more than, more than that, her mother says that she's doing better in school, two years ahead in school, and, uh, and doing very, very well in school, which she apparently wasn't doing before that. So let's switch gears a little bit and look what happens when you don't correct restoral posture. And here's somebody who's never had orthodontics but he in the mid forties has sleep apnea. 
And you can see he has surgery to advance both jaws. That's been done surgically from age, over that year. And that got rid of his sleep apnea. Kind of nice if you have to do it, but what about trying to prevent it? Let's look then at his son, who's coming in with some crooked teeth at age eight. <clears throat> to do our technique, we have to wait for the four upper incisors to come in if we've not treated in the primary dentition. So we had to wait for a whole year before we could do this. And I want you to look at it, this boy's airway. That is a pitifully small airway with him very highly likely to end up in the same shoes that his dad is with sleep apnea if he doesn't already have it right now. But notice how his face fell back in just one year, like many of your children and grandchildren are doing right now during this presentation. That's a sad thing. And if he continues on like the one that I showed you earlier, he's going to be even further back with a smaller airway. So using orthotropic to treat everything and bring him forward, that's where he ends up. And you can look at how his face came forward. And from age 9 to age 16, his face is almost on the norm. Now, I don't have the x-rays to show this because I quit taking them uh, by the time I was treating this child. Uh, I, I, was, I knew that we were improving the airway, and I didn't want to be radiating kids unnecessarily. Lots of parents don't like that. I think there's a movement away from that. Looking at him and his dad, here he, here is, he is with his jaws forward, and there he is with his dad's uh, jaws back. I happen to think he's going to be in a lot better shape than his dad. Here's another person in his mid-30s who also has sleep apnea. He's never had ortho. And by before age 40, he has stents put in the arteries of his heart. You can see how far back his jaws, both of them are. Again, he doesn't look that different than a lot of other people. His son is five and a half and has a super deep bite. And I recommended treatment to develop the face forward. Uh, and the mother said, there's no way he's going to do that. It requires too much cooperation. And she knew very well what it required because we were doing that treatment for this boy's older sister, who was about age eight or nine. So when she said, no, he's not going to do it, she knew really well. So we had then to, instead of treating in the primary dentition, we had to wait for the teeth to come in. We had to wait for the four upper incisors to come in, and they didn't come in until he was almost 11, a very, very late dental development pattern. Most kids would have their upper incisors in by age eight. But notice the disaster that happened from age five and a half to eight and a half of having his jaw fall back and from five and a half to 10 and a half, or 10, almost 11, see how far back his jaw is. Almost as much as his dad is back. His face literally melted away. So, able to do orthotropic starting at age 11, and we got his face to come forward some by age 12. That's nice, but it would have been nice if we could have started him at age five. The sad part is he really didn't get his oral posture completely correct, didn't become a total nasal breather. So from age 12 to age 18, he fell back from where we got him. Now, that's pretty sad. Now, let's look at him at age 18 and compare him with his dad and see that they're not that different. So my point here is that he's probably not that much better off than his dad and fairly likely to have sleep apnea like his dad. When I saw this, I, I said to myself, I can't let this happen, although I couldn't have coerced the boy to wear the appliances anyway, but it made me know that I needed to be treating the primary dentition. So I put this, pulled this slide off of the internet, and you see a class two patient here, a little, cute little girl in the primary dentition, and that's when you need to be treating, age three or four or five. You can't sit back and wait for them to get their teeth in. In reality, the orthodontic profession has no way of developing the face forward on teenage people. Despite the fact that lots of people are claiming that appliances do that, I would challenge anyone to show me that it really happens. And I believe me, I know what appliances are used out there. I've used many of them. So in reality, in the past, we're talking about orthodontics, which straightens teeth. But in reality, today, we have what I call ortho to health, which is a term that we've coined is treating the primary dentition to optimize the airway. 
Nobody better than a mother like this who has had extraction of teeth and has suffered with pain patterns and breathe, sleep and breathing problems. I reopened her extraction spaces where she'd had teeth taken out and she was highly motivated uh, because I helped her so much. She was more than happy to drive three hours from the San Diego area to north of Los Angeles where our, where our office was with her children. Three of them, for whom you're going to see two of them now. But look at this little four, -year, almost five-year-old girl with a super, super deep bite. In her smiling picture in the upper right, you all you see is gum tissue because her upper teeth are down and back so very far. They're back about 13 millimeters from where they ought to be. So we said, let's treat her right away. And again, the mom is going to drive three hours on the freeway of Southern California, probably dozens and dozens and dozens of times with her three kids for me to treat them. So... <clears throat> She hasn't really fallen back all that far, but sit back and wait, and she will. So here she's got full roots on those primary teeth, which is great. So we go ahead and we move the teeth up and out. Notice how we've taken the gummy smile and we've pushed the upper teeth out, creating a large overjet. Now, some of you may be scared to do this, but I'm not, since I've been doing this for advancing the teeth like this for 34 years. Now we develop the mandible forward using this other this appliance, which which uh, we have, which negates the headgear effect that we see with with so-called functional appliances. You can see she's come forward nicely. You can see her profile. Her gummy smile is gone, and she's happy. Her mom's happy. Here she is four months later. Uh, that's the same child. The girl with the gummy smile no longer has it, and her face is forward. Here she is, age 10. She's not wearing any appliances. And you can see from the front what she's like, with gummy smile being gone. That would not have gone away on its own. You can see a nice profile improvement for her. So let's look at her sister, who is all, her mom has witnessed apneic episodes for the three-year-old, again with another deep bite. And she's got a tongue tie, which we talk about in our uh, echo mentorship. But her upper anterior teeth are probably back about 12 millimeters. Her sister was 13. And her face is already further back than her sister's. So we do the same thing. We push the upper teeth up and out. And by the time we get the next set of pictures, she's missing her upper teeth, so you can't really see what her bite is like. But we can show you the profile improvement that we have achieved for her. Here then is a child that Steve Sheldon from Chicago referred to me in Los Angeles. And the, the child was five years of age and was pre roban sequence, sleep apnea and failure to thrive. Now you may say it's impossible to help a child like this. Well, just watch. This is what we were able to do by expanding laterally and developing the entire face forward by pushing the upper teeth out where they were meant to be. And you can see the improvement in the airway here. <clears throat> there in cross-section, you can see the improvement. There's Steve Shelvin with his book. And a good friend of mine took this very case and published it. And there you can see the x-rays in, in his book and showing the sleep study here where the sleep apnea is gone down to zero. And Steve, Steve Sheldon called me, I still remember it, from Chicago saying he was very excited when, when Ryan got his sleep report indicating that sleep apnea was gone. And Dr. Sheldon lecture to the uh, sleep doctors in Illinois about how he thought that orthotropics was the best thing to come down the pike in his entire career. So I followed up with this. Did, it, did, did this help this child in the long run? This is an email from his mother. They moved out of state, and this is what she said when he's 16, almost 17. And there's Ryan now with his sisters. He's apparently a rather aggressive tennis player. But I don't think things would have turned out so well for him had we not treated him in the primary dentition. And his mother was more than happy to spend all the energy, all the time, all the flights, the hotel, the rental car, the whatever, were probably probably 15 to 20 trips from Chicago to Los Angeles. I'm trying to treat, train other doctors to do this so people like don't have to travel for this kind of treatment. So you'll say, is this in the literature about improvement of the airway? The fact is, let's show you that. Uh, this was a, a series of my patients treated 
And I didn't do the research on them. I just took the x-rays. And you can see what happened on a statistical basis, a 31% improvement at the dorsum of the palate, 23% at the angle of the mandible at the base of the tongue, and even 9% down in the laryngopharynx. Now, please look at this child that this is pictured for. This is a class two patient. And when she came to me for her treatment, she had been told she needed to wear a headgear to shove her upper teeth back and she needed to have four teeth taken out. We did none of that. We had not only did we not push her upper teeth back, we pushed them forward 10 to about 10 millimeters and then brought her mandible forward. You can see the improvement in her profile. And this was that is the actual, in her case, the actual improvement uh, in her airway. And I saw this in the year 2000. And that's when we then decided to do the study, which you're seeing the results from, published in Cranio in April of 2007. It's in the refereed literature. And one of my mentors here is retired Dr. John Remmers, Harvard-trained physician. And this is the most important thing I learned from him. He said that it would not, OSA would not exist if both jaws were placed properly forward in the face. So let's look at some kids who've had treatment, well-meaning treatment. Here's somebody treated with an alpha appliance, and this isn't a negative thing about an alpha appliance. It's great to expand. And look how wide his arches are. He's six and a half. But he still suffers from sleep apnea, even with this massive width, which is wider than almost any child that is age. You'll not see kids come in with this kind of width. You can see his face is back. He really needs orthotropics to develop the face forward. Here's someone in the teenage years also treated with a nice appliance with ALF to get nice width. He's done a great job of getting the width. 43 millimeters is wider than almost anyone on this call, wider than I am. But she doesn't awake well rested. She's fatigued and snores occasionally. Her face is back rather dramatically. And that's her airway, which is better probably than most of the people who are watching us right now. Most people don't have that good of an airway. Hers is there, but she still doesn't sleep and breathe well. This is her brother, and he's got an even wider maxilla. Wow, look at that, 45 and a half millimeters. He snores, and I've sent him for a sleep test, which they never did. I'm 99% sure this is his x-ray that he has apnea. And his only way out of this, at this point, as, a, as in his late teenage years, there's nobody that has a magic wand that's going to make both jaws come forward. That's how far back he is from the, the Bolton norm. You can see the distance between his chin and his neck is very small. His airway is not great. Here's someone else, again, not treated in my office. Someone's given him a 38 millimeter intermolar width. That's great. But he's a restless sleeper, has all these symptoms. He's had a sleep test done, and he desaturated to 80% but no treatment was recommended by the treating doctor. I don't know what you're waiting for. You're waiting for him to have a heart attack or stroke. It's very sad. He's on these drugs, but nobody's doing anything actively. In reality, the only thing left for him to really help him would be surgery to advance both jaws. So who knows what he's going to be like in 20 years. Here's someone who comes into my office, diagnosed by a summer camp counselor, because they was at camp and the, the counselor saw him stop breathing, was scared to death, and referred him to someone who then referred him to me. I said, it's way too late to, to develop the face forward. We're going to do the only thing we can, which is to expand laterally. So that's what we do. You can see his face is back dramatically already, and he's got a horrible airway at 12.8 millimeters squared. That's like nothing. And that's it in cross-section. You'd be better off breathing through a drinking straw. Very bad airway. So we do our thing. And here you can see I've expanded the lower arch, what, 10 millimeters, the upper arch, 10 millimeters. Notice, please, that I haven't pushed the teeth off the bone support. Of those of you who've been taught, it would probably happen. I was taught, I don't know, we even, even thought about doing it in my ortho training program. And we got this pitifully small improvement in his airway uh, in this treatment. And I, and his mom said he's still, still having problems. So we now advance the front teeth. We got a spring on the upper and lower. We're going to push the teeth forward. And the mom is very happy after we've done this because she thinks he's not having any apneic episodes and she doesn't hear him snore anymore. But 
That's not necessarily true. In reality, we've taught here he has no appliances in, and we've referred him for another sleep test, and it turns out here he is, he's 14 and a half, and he's wearing a CPAP machine because he's been diagnosed with sleep apnea. We did what we could do at the at his age. The only way out of it for him now, if he wants to get rid of his sleep apnea, is to get double jaw surgery. So you can see his profile. And I would have loved, I'd love to have a magic wand to make the face grow forward from age eight, 11 to 14. Uh, maybe someone on this call will be smarter than I am and someday develop a way to do that. I'd love it. So let's look then at just the health implications of what happens. Here's a guy who came to me probably a decade ago now, grew up in the Philippines and had two upper teeth taken out to make his teeth fit. But in reality, what you're going to see is amazing because he has no chin, obviously. And that's what he said. All my insecurities relate to the fact that I have no chin. And I took his blood pressure and I nearly went through the roof when I saw this. I told him straight to his face, you need a sleep test yesterday. If you don't do something, you're going to die early. Those are the words I told him or words to that effect. He got a sleep test done two days later. <laughs> and as soon as he desaturated to 65%, the sleep clinic awoke him and sent him home. That's what happened, because he had severe sleep apnea. Obviously, they didn't want him to have a heart attack or stroke in their sleep clinic. So we recommended surgery for him, and 10 days post-surgery, he emails me this. His blood pressure plummeted from that, which I had recorded it at his initial exam. It was down to 20, 127 over 78, and has remained down ever since. His airway on the left was actually bigger than many of you people on this call right now, but he had horrible apnea. Now you can see on the right-hand side, his airway is dramatically better, and you can see his profile better. Now here he is after his surgery, a year and a half after his surgery. His jaws have both been brought forward, changed his life completely. Here he is from the front. And my reaction to this is surgery expensive and out of reach for everybody. Uh, the fact of the matter is we got to prevent the problem. And that's the whole point for talking about this. It's not about saying, oh, we need to do surgery. The fact of the matter is here he has a Facebook post from four years ago. And his dad just passed away. And that's the reason for his post. If you'll see him on the left-hand side. There he is as a little boy with his dad leaning over him. And his mouth is hanging wide open. As a teenager in the lower left, his mouth is hanging wide open. The point is, this is all preventable. That's the whole point. In reality, we've probably known this for more than 100 years. Here he is, before I retired just over a year and a half ago, he drove two hours to come and see me and thank me again, <clears throat> which was great. So let's just kind of summarize here and show you another little boy who comes in and these are the issues that his mom is telling us that he has. He's constantly telling his mom, I'm tired. And this is what she said. She says he looked sickly and had bags under his eyes, had a sleep test done at two, age two and a half. And this was the diagnosis and he desaturated to 93%. How many nights do we want him to desaturate? How much brain damage can we, can we uh, live with if he's your kid or your grandkid? So they did the tonsils and adenoids, which is very standard, but that still didn't help. He's still tired and hyperactive. So I took the case on and I said, we can expand him. But in reality, I think we're going to need to do orthotropics. His face is already back that much by age four. So I expanded him. There's expansion, 10 millimeters upper and lower expansion. And as a predicted, he still has an issue. So he's still tired and hyperactive, despite the fact that I've laterally expanded him like this. But I told you this is an anterior posterior problem, isn't it? I didn't bother with a sleep test because I don't need it. We need to develop him forward. His mom knows full well that he's not sleeping well. So you can see, even though we expanded him laterally, he still fell back. So what do we do? We now create the overjet. We must move the upper teeth forward. There is no other way. Here he's five years of age, and we can do that in the primary dentition. And his treatment's ongoing with the person who took over my practice. So it's now 
seven years ago this summer when I came up with this statement after being frustrated sitting in a uh, in a uh, lecture in Salt Lake City. The point is, it's an AP problem, and we need to do something about it now. This article uh, from one of the best-known names in all of sleep, Dr. Christian Gimeno, who passed away almost five years ago, uh, talks about the fact that when the jaws are back, you can expand, but it may not solve the problem, basically confirming my observation. So my message to you is, as parents, grandparents, as dentists with kids like this in your practice, what are you going to do? Are you going to turn your back on this? You're just going to ignore it uh, and say it's going to go away? Well, good luck with that. Uh, who's going to help her if you don't? Uh, that's my whole point. So hopefully I've made made some uh, made it obvious to you that I think there's a significant medical issue here that needs to be dealt with. Uh, I just barely scratched the surface of what really needs to be said here in this whole arena. Uh, I'm happy to have questions if anybody has questions. Uh, uh, I'm going to bring this down. I did. I did. I did it for you already. Don. Um, okay. Yeah, I did it already for you, Doctor okay. uh, Doctor Hang. That were uh, an enlightenment for my life. That was. Uh, yeah. You okay. You okay, Doctor? I, I pull it down already. Okay. Okay. Good. Yeah. <laughs> So you know, it's uh, it's an it was an alignment for me and a thousand of people out there. This is so uh, so uh, uh, incredible. Uh, I would say that you you have um, done something that uh, out of normal for for twenty years, twenty one year that I do in dentistry, and I haven't seen something like this. And it's gonna help my journey. Uh, it's gonna help my friend. And we can't wait to actually um, uh, learn more from you. Uh, you have a few mentorship programs, but before we talk about that, I want to ask you some questions. Like, you yes. know, um, the most people, uh, uh, the traditional orthodontists, you know, we learn to straight people teeth. We love to make people look good, and yes, uh, and th that that's that's really like how we train to do it, right? Mm -hmm. Right. But, uh, there must be uh, somehow you get connected to this kind of uh, knowledge that you started. Would you just share with the audience how did you start something like this? You know, it's well, and it's untraditional. It goes back a long ways. I was traditionally trained like everybody else, and I and I did what I was taught. I took out teeth in more than half of my cases, and I used headgears. I shoved the teeth back. Uh, but back in the very late nineteen seventies. In early 19 days, there was a general dentist in Minneapolis, Minnesota, who was teaching general dentists to do orthodontics. And his premise was that orthodontists are literally destroying faces and causing TMJ problems. In my early years of my practice, I was incensed by this guy. How can he know this? He's a general dentist. And I've spent two years of my life learning how to straighten teeth. He must be an idiot. I dismissed him. But then I was in practice long enough to look at the faces I was producing and then I've started to think this guy may be right. Well, in reality, I know he's right, but it, it put me into a tailspin. And I had lunch with a general dentist who said to me, uh, "Bill, I've done some continuing education, and I've, I've, I've met orthodontists who treat earlier than you do and don't take out teeth as often as you do. Why do you do what you do?" I was totally embarrassed, but I knew I had to change. So I started. This was November of 1981. I got on airplanes to go to courses everywhere. And it was a very uncomfortable next decade of my life from 1981 to the early 90s. And I was living in a small town in Vermont, but I had knew I had to stop taking out teeth and I was gone all the time to take courses and for, learn from other people. And I learned from various people. And the good news is I, I stopped taking out teeth. People liked what I was doing. They started to come from all over the place. And as I learned how to develop the face forward, I learned that from John Mew in London, England. I traveled to London in October of 1990, and that changed my life completely. And so one thing led to another. I've been doing this. And in the year 2000, I, I showed you that x-ray, showed how this girl's airway improves her dramatically. And 
that just set me on a course. I started going everything related to sleep apnea and learning as much as I could. I even went to the uh, American Association of Orthodontists meeting in Toronto to look at all the American Board of Orthodontics cases that were treated and shown there. And I looked at their lateral head x-rays pre and post treatment. And I was very much impressed by very much, excuse me, very much depressed by what I saw. And that's uh, that made me decide I need to change this. I'm an Eagle Scout. I promised to do my best, do my duty to God and country. And I got that award when I was 15. And my whole life since learning all of this is basically, I have to share this with other people. And I tell everybody, be skeptical of what I have to say, but be skeptical of every lecturer. Absolutely ask questions and ask plenty of them. That's how I got where I am. And I started doing things on my own. After I gained confidence, I had a lot of mentors, but I just decided and learned that most of what I'd learned in, in orthodontic training really had no basis in science. And I can go on and on about that, but I don't have time here to, to really deal with that. But I've been doing this long enough to know that it works. And now I'm 77 years of age, and I don't want to go to my grave with this knowledge. I'm here to share it, which is why I have the mentorship program. So beautiful, Dr. Ryuhen. I am uh, uh, I am I am blessed to just to, to hear your presentation with the audience out there. Uh, but this is a blessing. This is an amazing thing that uh, I definitely cannot hold this information back. I have to share because this actually it affects every single family, uh, especially young kids, especially the orthodontist friend, especially those who do braces. Um, and and Peter down this uh, a perfect chance for them to help the kid. Um, what can I say? Yeah, dentists are in the best situation because they have the behavioral skills to deal with the kids who are age three and four, and that's the the that's the group that really needs to be treated really as they were doing like I showed you a hundred years ago or more. Uh, orthodontists basically most of them don't want to even see a patient until they're age seven when they've got some permanent teeth in. And to be honest, that's too late, way too late if you're going to be dealing with these kids and do it right. Yeah. Pediatric dentists, general dentists who do ortho and orthodontists, many of them are skeptical, but they are they're skeptical without knowledge of what's really being taught. It's very sad. But, you know, obviously you can see this uh, makes sense to you. Uh, and we we embellish on this in our in our in our echo mentorship called early childhood health centered orthodontics. So it's not just about this thing called orthotropics. It's a lot of, about a lot of other things we do, basically to never, ever, ever retract, pull anything back ever. And yet, many orthodontic treatment plans and traditional orthodontics retract routinely, routinely retract, and don't think about it. <clears throat> There's so many questions in terms of orthodontist uh, uh, mechanism. And, uh, you know, this is uh, uh, the place where it's, uh, I don't want to use this platform to talk about it, but uh, during the mentorship program, uh, it's a perfect chance for a uh, doctor who do dental over on this years, and they, they're going to ask secret questions, and, and they're going to learn from Dr. Bill Hang, and uh, just uh, so, so much secret haven't been released yet, but it's no longer really secret when, you know, you, he's, Dr. Hang is willing to share those slides and the, the, the point is are, do we really want to um, feel comfortable with what we're doing or we want to improve the not only just the, the, the ecstatic part but the health uh, the long-term health of the individual we talk about ADHD autism all related to airway space the oxygen the mouth oxygen level that help the patient to um, uh, the kid to 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 function, the adult to function, and uh, so what so what picture that you show before and after is cry, it make me cry. That's like the <laughs> lifesaver, lifesaver. No, uh, it, no, it it once you see it, you can't unsee it. And uh, I love questions. I I I wish people would ask the questions. And and uh, again, I. I'm 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 a skeptic of everything. I, I had a, a father who was a taught electrical and nuclear engineering at the University of Illinois, and he taught me to be a skeptic. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, but when I was a student, I sat in the back and didn't say much. I just took it all in, 
and real and thought, okay, I'm going to learn to do this better than anybody. But once you really start to ask the questions, then you begin to say, wait a minute, there's so much I didn't learn here. And, you know, when you explain this to parents, they understand it. No problem at all. They understand it. And people wonder, can you make a living doing this? Well, let's just put it this way. When I was in practice, I'm not joking or bragging, but I had patients from more than 30 states and several foreign countries coming to me outside of Los Angeles for me to treat them. Some for orthotropics, many of them were coming because they'd already had four teeth taken out or two teeth taken out, and they hated what they looked like. They had airway issues, they had TMJ issues that they, not me, determined were related. And they came for me to reopen spaces and do other related issues. Like for Bobby, the guy, the, the Philippine gentleman that I just showed you, mm -hmm. who had double jaw surgery. I mean, those people would move mountains and spend any amount of money so they can have a life. Untreated sleep apnea is good for a 20% reduction in life expectancy. You figure that out. It's a big deal. So, Dr. Lira, a quick question for those who already have uh, orthodontic treatment uh, or wisdom for, for teeth removed, uh, if they are in their uh, adult life, the right. surgery is okay for jaw surgery? Surgery is one of many things that can be done. It's not, it, it's got to be considered uh, on the table for everybody who's had this done, who's had retraction done. Having said that, there are patients who can have, you can reopen extraction spaces and get rid of sleep apnea that way. And in my ERRS, that's extraction, retraction, regret syndrome mm -hmm. study group of mentorship, uh, I show how to make that diagnosis. And I sh even show a case where we reopened extraction spaces only in the maxillary arch. And a woman who had sleep apnea got rid of her sleep apnea, and I have sleep studies to prove that from a board-certified sleep specialist. She gained 10 pounds from her first sleep study to the one where we, when we had her in treatment. If she, you gain weight, you're going to have more of a problem with sleep apnea. But despite the fact that she gained 10 pounds from the first sleep study to the second one, her sleep apnea was completely eliminated merely by me reopening spaces in the upper. Now, don't take that as something where I'm promising that that's going to work. That I'm only opening the door to you. Mm -hmm. There's so much to consider. And that's what we're dealing with, with our ERRS, extraction, retraction, regret syndrome mentorship. Now, you may laugh at that ERRS, which is an acronym we came up with, which basically we came up with that because it's a mistake, in my humble opinion, to retract. And it's ERRS is defined as a constellation of aesthetic, functional, and emotional signs and symptoms resulting or, re or occurring after a retra orthodontic retraction. And all of this is preventable because there are ways to prevent retraction. There, but... Many, as I said, many of the treatment plans that are currently used retract. We've known, for instance, that I had, since 1981, in a journal, July of 1981, that the upper teeth in class two patients really don't stick out. The mandible is always too far back. In reality, if you know that, really understand this, the maxilla in class two patients is always too far back. And I use that term always too far back in class two patients. <clears throat> you need to move the maxilla forward. You need to move the mandible forward. And when you do, A, the face looks phenomenal and the airway has the chance of opening up. I have never promised improvement in an airway to any person, any human being, and never would. Having said that, I know what I would do and have done for my own grandkids and what I think other people would do for their own kids or grandkids. Uh, so there are, in, our, in that second mentorship, the ERRS mentorship, uh, we we deal with a very, very sophisticated diagnostic process that must be done. You can't just knee-jerk say, oh, open the four spaces up and you're going to get rid of sleep apnea. No, that's not the way it works. It may work, but sometimes reopening the spaces is absolutely not what you should do. We do other crazy things in that, like adding, adding extra bicuspid teeth, opening spaces where nobody's even had teeth taken out. This is something that I've done on a, quite a number of patients, and I have sleep tests to prove 
that indeed you can get rid of sleep apnea by doing it in certain select cases. So jaw surgery is not the only way. What I'm saying to you is there's a lot to learn and that's what I'm here for. I'm semi-retired. I get up in the morning. I don't have to go to the office. I have breakfast and then I go to my computer and I respond <laughs> to the people who are in my mentorship programs. And sometimes I'm there for 15 minutes, sometimes there for two hours or more responding to them and helping them with their cases, cases and holding their hand over the internet. We get together uh, twice in each of the mentorships, twice each year. Physically, next week, we're gonna. I'm going to actually be in Walnut Creek, California for the ERRS mentorship uh, this very weekend. Uh, and we'll have a number of people coming in. We'll talk about cases. They post their cases. We have monthly webinars. I'm here to hold people's hands. I've made all the mistakes in the world, I think, getting where I am. And my job here is to help other people not have to... Uh, walk through a minefield and have their leg blown off by walking over a mine that is that is a we can recognize and not have to worry about okay yes. uh, <laughs> hope that helps i think a question before your uh, time up for because you may be easy uh so those uh dentists ask the question they they, they say they see your your, your presentation what is the ethics like perfect uh is that like an asylum remove your asylum what, what, I, I don't, what what is your your specific question? Yeah, appliance. What is the what is the what are the orthotropic appliances? Okay, that, there are a number of ways to do this, and and people will always ask me what appliances do you use, and mm -hmm. that's I in the in the mentorship program we teach the appliances which we use, okay. and people often ask me what lab do I get them from. That's not the point. It's mm -hmm. not like I have a secret here. It's not, you can't just put the appliance in somebody's mouth. There mm -hmm. are very sophisticated things that you must do. There's a protocol, appointment by appointment, expanding like this and advancing. You have specific parameters that you have to do. Mm -hmm. And they're very specific protocols and there are steps that you have to understand. So although I can tell you the names of the appliances, that's irrelevant. Okay. I could to give you the lab to get them no more could you do the treatment than could you could i give you the keys to a 747 and you go out on the tarmac jump okay. into 747 and take off it's not in the cards okay. so another question, i'm here to help another question is uh, uh i saw the picture that you 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 zip your your mouth and you run uh you did that two hours and there's a kind of uh um uh, um, racing when you were doing it, you were just completely biased for the mouth. I, I, I didn't really understand. I, I have to apologize. I have hearing aids in, and I'm, I'm hard of hearing. No, no problem. And I, 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 I saw a picture of you, and you know, when you were um, doing the marathon, you didn't wear them, then you, you throw them the mouth, right? Uh, taping the mouth, yes. You didn't well, I, the whole time. Pardon? I I ran the marathon with that together, but I don't I don't need to be taped. I've been running with my lips together because I trained myself to do that uh, starting 12 years ago. Wow. And and it's it's very possible to do. I heard Patrick McCune from from uh, Galway, Ireland, speak 12 years ago and that I've been running for now 54 years. Uh, I ran an hour and a half before this seminar tonight just because I I'm a nut and uh but when I heard Patrick, I decided to train myself to to breathe with my uh, to run with my lips together, and I had run 19 marathons by then. I ran the Pasadena Marathon in Pasadena, uh, at, was my 20th marathon, and I came in second in my age group. That was the first marathon I ran with my lips together. Not only that, I'm going to make a plug for another book here, uh, "Breath" by James Nestor. That came out in 2020. I read the book and realized that I was still, even though I was running with my lips together, I I still didn't truly understand the, the whole importance of nasal breathing and the fact that we breathe too much. Nestor talked about running, but holding your breath and run and breathing less often. So I was breathing once every five strides, once every five strides, and I'd been doing that for years. 
After reading Nestor's book, I started holding my breath on the exhale. And within a matter of probably six months, I was breathing once every 15 strides. And that's the way I run now. Mm. And, I, and I, haven't, I haven't slowed down at all. The point is, if you read, if you read James Nestor's book or if you read Patrick McCune's book, uh, The Breathing Cure or the Oxygen Advantage, you'll realize that all of us breathe too much. And the less you breathe, the better off you're going to be. If you, yeah, but you must be a nasal breather. You've got to slow your breathing down. It's, there's a lot to learn. There, uh, we're dealing with significant health issues in this country, most of which are made worse by mouth breathing. Thank you very much. I thank you so much. I also need to help us to put here back the, the last slide that you had with program. Uh, so that's where uh, somebody will come and contact your um, the program to a membership program, please. Okay. Uh, wow. Okay. Get it up. Those of you who are watching, you know, it's, it's my honor to have a chance to talk to that children. And we're going to start a slide. That's where you can go. I think you just post me there. Okay. Me okay. Wait, well, let me try and find it. Yeah. Ah. It's amazing that the uh, first that we present, and uh, it's going to help so many people to be aware of what we're talking about here. It's ah, that's not it. That's no, 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 no. Ah, I don't. Already put it down. I put I put the whole lecture down. Uh, yeah, the, the contact I mean, I, information is ortho to health. O r t h o to health h-e-a-l-t-h -E uh, ortho to health dot com okay, that's where you contact us you definitely okay. gonna see it on google and uh, okay. i just want to make sure that uh well it's a feature that the range of a point of age i hope that uh, we have made penetration but both of you you listen you want to call the mentorship program you are doing uh to do i think i'm just doing it i understand the field but i'm going to you want to learn this this is, this is what we uh, we can get to is you know now you help your person that your family family you know do that the kid needed so help your hand I really appreciate your time you are amazing thank you so much well thank you very much Lockford happy to have the opportunity thank you